It's good to see some of you again. I, was, I wasn't here last week, and I know that some of you returned, so so good to see you all. This morning, I was, since it's Father's Day and all, I was going to preach a sermon on how to be a better dad. Since I haven't figured that out yet, we're going to turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 3, and it's going to be a message about God instead. This morning, we're going to think about a dilemma. And I'm convinced it's the ultimate dilemma to be solved. Now, one of the most popular dilemmas in the history of Western thought is called the Euthyphro Dilemma. Who's heard of the Euthyphro Dilemma? Anyone? Okay, no. (laughs) It's actually found in one of uh, Plato's dialogues. The ancient Greek philosopher Plato would write down these discussions that Socrates had with his contemporaries. And many of us are aware of what is known as Socratic Dialogues. Who's heard of Socratic Dialogues? Okay, there you go. These are modeled after these discussions which took place long ago. So in 399 BC, Socrates was having one of these dialogues with a man named Euthyphro. And Euthyphro said to Socrates at one point, he said, I would indeed affirm that holiness is what the gods all love, and its opposite is what the gods all hate, unholiness. But then Socrates challenges him on this, as Socrates always does, and he said, think of this. Is what is holy holy because the gods approve it, or do they approve it because it is holy? And then later he asks again, what are we to say about the holy, Euthyphro? According to your argument, is it loved by all the gods? Euthyphro, yes. Socrates says, because it is holy or for some other reason? Euthyphro, no, it's for that reason. But then later in the conversation again, Socrates ends up showing Euthyphro that he's actually failed to explain what it means for something to be holy. The only thing Euthyphro has said about it is that it's loved by the gods. Socrates says this to Euthyphro about holiness. He says, what it is as yet you have not said. So if you please, do not conceal this from me. No, begin again. Say what the holy is, and never mind if the gods do love it. Come, speak out. Explain the nature of the holy and the unholy. He wants to know what it is. But then Euthyphro says, now Socrates, I simply don't know how to tell you what I think. Somehow everything that we keep putting forward moves about around us in a circle. Nothing will stay stay where we put it. So this issue hasn't been solved between Euthyphro and Socrates. Is what is holy, holy because the gods love it, or do they love it because it is holy? As Christians, we know that there's only one God, so we could modify this a little bit and ask, is something holy because God approves it, or does God approve it because it's holy? What do you think? That's the Euthyphro dilemma you'll come across when studying the history of philosophy. But if you ever study the history of theology and how theology develops over time, you'll also hear something called the divine dilemma. The divine dilemma. This divine dilemma, the phrase was originated with St. Athanasius. He was the chief defender of the deity of Christ in the 4th century, and many of you are now well acquainted with him from coming to Sunday school. And he wrote a classic work entitled, On the Incarnation. In chapter 1 of the book, he deals with the topics of creation and the fall of man. And then in the next chapter, it's entitled, Divine Dilemma and its Solution in the Incarnation. The Divine Dilemma and its Solution in the Incarnation. So the dilemma is that God told Adam that in the day that he eats of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge, good and evil, he will die. And we know, of course, that he ate, and the entire created order caused, um, it caused corruption among the entire universe. So here's the divine dilemma. God has a choice. Does he just let everything deteriorate? Well, that would be improper. But he did say that Adam would die, and thus all of his descendants would too. So the other option would be, would God go back on his word? Well, that would be absurd, right? 
So what's God to do without violating his own nature and his own word? This is the divine dilemma. And pondering questions like this help us better understand the significance of why Christ had to come to this earth. But nowadays when we seek to do uh, apologetics or seek to defend the faith of that was once delivered to the saints when we seek to defend the truths of Christianity. A lot of the questions nowadays aren't so much focused on God and, and His nature and His plans for the ages anymore. The questions that people have about Christianity are far less concerned on the most part. They're far less concerned about understanding God truly. The questions typically are more human-centered and that they seek to vindicate man's goodness at times. You know, now people are asking, why do, good, why do bad things happen to good people? We've all heard that, right? If God is so loving, why does he send people to hell? If God is so good, why does he punish people for eternity for not believing in him? If God was really just, why would he subject others to torment forever just for not believing in him and, not, and just sinning briefly in this short lifetime? Why would he subject them to torment forever? These are the big questions now. And it appears that in our time, we're uncomfortable with the notion that perhaps we are deserving of judgment. But this morning, as we seek to turn our focus away from the modern dilemmas that assume the, the goodness and the innocence of man, we're going to focus on the divine dilemma. Not a dilemma imagined by Euthyphro or St. Athanasius, but St. Paul the Apostle. This is the dilemma that Paul recognizes has been the concern, not just for his day, but for all of the ages up to that point. Before Socrates even came on the scene, people were perplexed about this dilemma. But although the dilemma Paul recognizes is universally concerning for all of the ages, it's often what the masses fail to consider in our culture. But this is the question that he seeks to answer as he is moved by the Holy Spirit. This is the question before us today. If God is good, and if God is righteous, and if God is just, if God is just, how can a good and righteous and just God forgive wicked and sinful people? How can that happen? As the final judgment approaches, many today have an emotional aversion to God judging certain individuals. But Paul is bringing up that the, a, a major concern for humanity up until his day is on what basis can God forgive certain individuals who are wicked? From the beginning, the saints have always recognized that our God is a just God. We recall before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, Adam was stand, I mean, Abraham was standing before the Lord and he asked, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? He asked, if there's 50 righteous people there, well, you're not going to destroy it, right? Then he goes on to say to the Lord in Genesis 18, 25, far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? There is a recognition here that, that the righteous and the wicked ought not to be treated the same. They ought to be treated in accordance with what justice requires. Justice is giving someone what is due to them, and if anyone is just, it's the judge of all the earth. Amen? So as we get into our text this morning, we'll be reminded about what it can teach us about the justice of God. So would you look in our text, Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 19, the Apostle Paul writes, Now, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of 
of the glory of God being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness because in the forbearance of God He passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time so that He would be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. So I first want us to understand the righteousness of God through the law. The righteousness of God through the law. Look again at verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. The law in verse 19 is talking about Israel's law. This is also the law of Moses or the Mosaic law. This law was the wisdom of God for that chosen nation. One reason that God chose Israel and gave them the law is so that they would become a light to the other nations. They were to be an example of God's holy wisdom before a dark and deranged world. And Moses speaks to Israel about the commands of the law in Deuteronomy 4, 6. He said, so keep the, and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. That's Deuteronomy 4, 6. This was a, a major purpose of the Mosaic law for the nation as a whole. And the law had several aspects to it. It had, it had a civil code. This dealt with the political and domestic affairs of the nation. How to wage war, you know, how to use land, how to deal with debts and so on. That's the civil code. It also had a ceremonial aspect. These were the regulations for worshiping God and approaching a holy God. It contained animal sacrifices, rituals, and religious festivals. So we have the civil code, we have the ceremonial code, and finally it had a purely moral aspect. Some of these moral laws are found in what is called the Ten Commandments, which we're all aware of. These moral principles are eternal and unchanging, regardless of what culture you're in or what type of government that you are under. And so if Israel as a nation obeyed the Mosaic law in all of its facets, they would be blessed in their land also. God says to them in Leviticus 25, 18 through 19, You shall thus observe my statutes and keep my judgments, so as to carry them out, that you may live securely in the land. Then the land will yield its produce, so that you can eat your fill and live securely in it. So the purpose of the law as a nation was to reflect God's character among the nations, so that the peoples of the entire earth would turn to the Lord, and if Israel also obeyed their own law that God gave them, they would be prosperous and secure in their land. Those are two national purposes of the Mosaic Law. But we find in our text today that God had another purpose for the law, not on the national level, but on the individual level as well. See verse 19 again. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. So we see Exhibit A, the purpose of the law for individuals is that the law shows one's accountability to God. The individual Israelites were reminded of their accountability before God when they attempted to observe their law. But in the previous chapter of this epistle, Paul explains that not only the Israelites are accountable to their law, but everyone is accountable to God's law. An individual is accountable to whatever God, whatever law that God revealed to them. There's a moral aspect to the law that God has revealed to the Israelites, and He reveals these laws to all people at all times. These laws are, are the moral law that's written on our hearts. And Paul explains this in Romans 2, 12 through 16. This is from earlier in the chapter. Romans 12, 2, 12 through 16. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all those who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, 
but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law instinctively perform the requirements of the law, these, though not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience testifying in their thoughts, alternately accusing or defending them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of mankind through Christ Jesus. What he's saying is that everyone, regardless of whether or not you've heard the Ten Commandments, there's certain things that you can't not know. Woven into our human nature is the ability to discern what we were made to do versus what we were not made to do. This is the natural law. You know, some say that morals are relative to the culture that we live in, or they're based on what the majority of the people think is right. Someone said to the, this to me the other week, actually. But for anyone who claims that, um, you can, you, sometimes you might have to use an extreme or crass example. You say, well, if, let's say, torturing babies for fun, is, is, is that okay if the majority say that it's right? If the majority said that's right, who would say that that's okay, right? Well, maybe they'll say, and this is what often happens, they might say, well, it's not right for me. I, I don't like it. Because they're too afraid to say that it's objectively wrong and all, anything is objectively wrong in all times and all places. So they say, well, I don't personally like that. What they're doing at that point is they're making morality relative to the individual. But imagine if uh, I was talking to a woman and she said, you know, morals are relative to the particular person. It's just based on your opinion. What if the woman said right and wrong is just based on what you think? And all of a sudden, as you're saying that, I just snatched her purse from her. <laughs> You'd find out quickly, based on her reaction, that she really knew it was wrong for me to do that, regardless of anyone's opinion. You'll see it in her eyes and how she responds that it was wrong majority opinion or otherwise. Sometimes you can't truly understand what someone believes by just on what they're saying, but you might be able to find out what they really believe by their reactions. We all know that certain things are wrong. We know that murdering a human being is wrong. We all know, especially thanks to uh, modern scientific knowledge, that murdering a human being in the womb is wrong. Man-stealing and putting someone in slavery is wrong. Homosexuality is wrong. Lying is wrong. Unfaithfulness to your spouse is wrong. And we all know that these things are wrong even without the Mosaic Law, even without the Ten Commandments, and even without the Bible telling us. Sure, people make excuses for their actions and they try to rationalize their behavior to make themselves not feel guilty about these things. But the reason that they make excuses and they rationalize their behavior is because they know in their hearts that they've done wrong. And their conscience is testifying that this is wrong and their thoughts are accusing them this is wrong, but they suppress the truth, which you can read more about in Romans chapter 1. But notice in verse 13 of Romans chapter 2, Paul says in Romans chapter 2, 13, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. So whatever law you find yourself under, whether the Mosaic law is a Jew, which has been done away with, or God's moral law, the natural law that the whole world is subject to, if you perfectly and perpetually continue to obey that law, you can be justified. And if you're justified, that means you're declared righteous before God. God declares that you are just and he treats you as such. You have the privileges and rights as a, of a just person. It's the opposite of being condemned. It's being acquitted of all wrongdoing. It's a forensic and, and legal word. If a person is justified by God and before God, all the requirements of the law that pertains to them must have been fulfilled. But if you look in our text in chapter 3 again, starting in verse 19 and moving into verse 20, Paul says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, 
so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. No flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. If you've been following closely, you might be wondering, how is this claim compatible with Romans 2.13? Romans 2.13 again. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. But then Paul turns around and says in Romans 3.20 in our text, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in God's sight. For through the law comes knowledge of sin. So can humans be right with God by obeying the law or not? Is Paul contradicting himself? In Romans chapter 2 he says yes, in Romans chapter 3 he says no. Well, Paul is not contradicting himself. If we obeyed God's law perfectly, if, if we gave God the worship that is due and the, the love that is due our neighbor perfectly and perpetually, yes, God could declare us just. But the problem is that nobody obeys God's law perfectly in this fallen world. Nobody obeys God's law perfectly since we're all subject to evil, sin, death, and the devil himself. So here we have to consider the limits of the law. And to be clear, there's nothing wrong with the moral law per se, but there's something wrong with us. Since we're corrupted with sin, letter B, the law cannot justify a sinner. And the more that you try to obey the moral commands of God, the more that you're going to be aware of your failure. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. To sin actually means to, to miss the mark. Sin is, a, is a, a lack of goodness or virtue that should be in us, but it's not. It's missing. And is there anyone that would dare to say that they are without sin? Remember what James said to the Jewish Christian audience in James 2, 10 through 12. For Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of a law. You break one, you break them all. And we've all broke God's moral law. Jesus teaches that even evil thoughts and attitudes defy God's law. And the greatest commandment, according to Jesus, is to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Who does that perfectly all the time? Nobody. We all break the greatest commandment all day, every day. We're all lawbreakers. And if we're all lawbreakers, that means we are all guilty. And if we're guilty for breaking God's law, no obedience to the law can reverse that guilt. It's too late for that. So here, again, we arrive back at the dilemma of the day. How can God take away our guilt and declare anyone righteous while still remaining just? You know, God's not in debt to his creatures. He doesn't owe us anything. But there, there is a sense in which we must consider his justice and understand from his justice from the scriptures and try to seek to understand how he acts in accordance with that. It's perplexing. When we look to the Old Testament, we see that many sinners were declared righteous. For example, I mentioned Abraham earlier. He was declared righteous. This isn't in your, your notes or on the screen, but if you're taking notes, write down Genesis 26.5. In that text, God said about Abraham, Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. It's a curious statement because this was before God even gave the Mosaic Law. And second of all, we know that Abraham was not morally perfect. So how is it that he is described as the one who has obeyed God's commandments, statutes, laws in Genesis 26.5? Another example, King David. King David. Everyone knows King David. We all know the story from 2 Samuel 11. From his roof, he saw a married woman bathing, Bathsheba. He sent his messengers to 
come get her and take her to him. And what did he do? After that, he got her pregnant and then had her husband killed. That's adultery and murder, two sins that are worthy of capital punishment under the Mosaic law. Wow. So you keep your finger in Romans chapter 3 and turn to Psalm 51 for a moment. And as you're turning there, I'm going to read what David says in Psalm 32, 1 through 2. He says, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And he goes on to say in Psalm 32, 5, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. David says, the Lord forgave his sin. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. This means that God is reckoning that a sinner not be condemned for their sin. Now, if you look in Psalm 51, if you turn there in verse 1, after David's gross Sin, he said in verse 1, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Take them away. Cover them. Look again in verse 4. Against you, you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. He's saying that God is a righteous and just judge. But then he goes on to say in verse 9, for instance, hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Would a, would a just judge ignore evil? David says, blot out my iniquities. But let's think about what the Word of God says elsewhere, such in Proverbs 17, 15. The Word of God says, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. It's an abomination to God when someone declares a wicked person righteous. God hates when a judge would let the wicked go free. So it doesn't appear that God is acting against his own principles when he forgives and justifies a wicked sinner like David. You can turn back to Romans chapter 3. Although God's justice would differ from human justice, since he's not a creature, something still does not seem right here. But let's continue reading in Romans 3, beginning in verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. As sinful people, we've established that none of us can ultimately be declared righteous by doing the deeds of the law. But now, apart from observing God's law, the way to attain the righteousness of God has been revealed. This is the righteousness of God that we need to have peace with God, and it would necessarily entail forgiveness as well, because we've already sinned. It's the way of attaining righteousness that's already been seen in the law and the prophets. You know, sometimes the Old Testament is divided into two sections, the law and the prophets. The writing of Moses, which is the law, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, and the rest of it is the law, I mean the prophets, which is the rest, divided into the law and the prophets. That's the whole Old Testament. So we see in the law, sinners like Abraham were credited righteousness. We saw in the prophets that David was forgiven and therefore seen as righteous before God. Yet in both cases, both men were declared righteous, not because they fulfilled some deeds of the law, but rather because they believed God. They believed His promises. And through faith or believe in God's promise of salvation today, apart from any deeds of the law or any moral actions, that's how we can become declared righteous as well. By faith, we receive God's gift of righteousness reckoned to our account. As Paul says in verse 21, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. So now let us consider number two, the righteousness of God 
through faith in Christ. We saw the righteousness of God through the law, which we're not going to attain to. So there's another way of righteousness, the righteousness of God through faith in Christ. Continue in verse 23, for all who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know that when man was created, he had direct communion and, and fellowship with God in Eden. But since the fall, man has been deprived of this communion. And, and under the Mosaic law, this deprivation was illustrated in that the, the radiant glory of God was restricted to the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. And the high priest could only enter in there once a year. And this reminds us that due to our corruption and our unrighteousness, we've been cut off from God's presence. And we need a holy and just representative to bring us back into his presence. Yet for those who believe that Christ is the one who represents us to bring us back in, we are, verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So we are, letter A, we are justified as a gift through grace. Grace is getting a gift that we don't deserve. And God's grace accomplishes for us what we can't accomplish for ourselves. So it's not through our, our, our good works of observing God's law that we're justified, but rather through Christ's gracious work of redemption. The word redemption means to ransom by the payment of a price. And Paul uses it here in the text to describe believers in Jesus. They're, they're bought out of the slave market of sin. Believers are redeemed from a life of sin. And the price of redemption was none other than Christ's death. Christ purchased believers for God. Christ's death itself was the ransom payment to God to buy us back and bring us back into communion with himself. The text says in verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So letter B, God's righteousness is demonstrated by displaying Christ as a propitiation. Propitiation. Some texts might say expiation, but when Paul says in verse 25 that God displayed Christ publicly as a propitiation, the Greek word literally means here that he was sent forth as a mercy seat. Same word as mercy seat. Under the Mosaic law, the mercy seat was the, the golden uh, covering over the Ark of the Covenant. There was a sacred box type object that stood in the holies of holies in the Jewish tabernacle and later in the Solomonic temple. And the blood of the animal sacrifices were sprinkled on the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement. And it was there that God would meet with Moses or the Jewish high priest once the blood was spilt. But now Jesus is identified as the mercy seat where God and man meet. He is the mercy seat. He is the high priest. He's the, he's the sacrifice and the one making the sacrifice. When Jesus shed his blood on the cross, he was the one who satisfied God's justice on our behalf. He satisfied the demands of the law, not just by obeying it perfectly. He loved the Father with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. He loved his neighbor. He obeyed all of God's commandments, but he also bore the law's punishment in our place. Instead of men like David undergoing capital punishment that he deserved, instead of, of, of David bearing the curse of being separated spiritually from God, Christ would pay his penalty instead. That's why David could be declared just. And he did the same for you, and he did the same for me. Verse 25 again, He is the one whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God sent him to do this publicly. He sent him to do this publicly to demonstrate before the world that he really is just. He sent him to do this publicly to show the world that sin has been dealt with. He didn't just forgive David's sin and let a wicked man go free without any basis. No, 
Christ condemned David's sin and my sin and your sin in Christ's body on the tree. Even under the Mosaic law, there were, there were animal sacrifices show that God doesn't tolerate sin since it dishonors him and it destroys his creation. But deep down, the Jews who trusted God knew that those rituals would never really take away sin. They needed a human to pay for their human sin. But this man had to be more than human in order to bear the guilt of the whole world. He had to be the God-man. Yet before Jesus Christ came and died, it, it, to some it might have looked as though God was unjust for forgiving sinful people who merely just believed in His promises. But the basis for God justifying sinners throughout all of human history always has been and forever will be Christ's death, which has timeless and eternal value. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, He who made Him, He made Him, the Father made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. What this indicates is that although Jesus never sinned, God treated Him as a sinner on the cross. And He did this so that although we are sinners, God can treat us as though we are righteous. This is the great exchange. And all we have to do is trust in Jesus to provide this gift of righteousness to you based on what he's already done on the cross. This is how God can be the just one and the justifier of those who have faith in Christ Jesus. So we get back to the question, is something holy or just because God loves it? Or does God love something because it's holy or just? The answer is neither. God is holiness. God is justice. He is the standard of justice itself. And whatever he pronounces just in the world already flows from his eternally righteous nature. He's the standard of justice. And for all those who are longing to see a picture of perfect justice, look back to the cross. And there you'll also find his eternal love grace, and mercy as well. Let us pray. Our God, you are the just one and you are the holy one. We have no hope of being in your holy presence unless you give us the gift of your righteousness. Thank you in your great love for sending Christ to die for the ungodly. We ask that once we recognize that we are righteous and that we are declared just, that we might live in accordance with that declaration. We know that one day when your son comes to get us, we will be made like him. There will be no more remaining sin in our body, and in our soul. Until that day, continue to purify us and keep our eyes on your Son. May you be glorified as we continue to worship you this morning. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.